Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for episode two of Encountering the Lord in the Gospel of Mark Online Lenten Bible Study. Last week, Leo talked about um, how Mark begins the gospel, what the good news really is, what God really wants you to hear. And this week, we're going to be talking about how Jesus begins his ministry and his two commandments to us, repent and believe. I'm going to let Leo take it away, but we're so excited you guys are joining us again. Thanks so much. Why don't we begin with prayer, okay? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, during this Lenten season, you call us to repent, you call us to believe, to believe more deeply, to repent more fully. I just ask that you give us the grace to repent as you call us to, and to believe in the way you want us to believe. Help us to turn away from old ways of thinking and help us to embrace your good news, the good news of your love and your mercy. Jesus, we entrust ourselves to you and our families, and we make this prayer as every other prayer in your name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we're back. I remember last week I asked you to think about and ask, you know, what is the good news, right, that Jesus, and Jesus is giving the good news, Mark starts off with good news, what is the good news you need to hear, and what is the good news God wanted to give you? I hope you heard something from the Lord. It's a little, a little odd sometimes to try to ask that question, you know, it's not like you can hear a booming voice, but you'll hear it in your heart, and you'll know it when you hear it, so keep, keep asking, keep praying, okay? Last week... We talked about Mark and the very first words of his gospel, where he said, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, right? And we talked about Jesus as Christ, Messiah, and Son of God. So that's how Mark begins the gospel. He has the very first gospel. Now, let's look at how Jesus begins his ministry. The very first words that he says in the very first gospel that was ever written which I think is kind of cool, but anyway. The very first words he says as he comes on the scene, Mark doesn't tell us anything that Jesus says when he's baptized by John the Baptist. It's right after he gets baptized, he goes into the desert for 40 days, and then he comes into, into Galilee. And when he arrives in Galilee, he proclaims, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent and believe the good news. Or as, as our translation says, repent and believe the gospel, which we know is good news, right? So what I want to do this week is focus on those two commands of Jesus, repent and believe the good news, okay? Now, typically when we hear repent, I, I know me, I grew up, you know, Catholic grade school and all that stuff and going to confession all the time. I think about repentance in terms of what sins have I committed that I need to ask God to forgive me of. And of course, that's a very important component to repentance because sin separates us from God, it darkens our consciences, it, it kind of clouds the way we relate to other people. We need that sin gone, so we need to repent. But if you look at God's, the Gospel of Mark, in very few places do you see anyone asking Jesus to forgive them. I don't, I, I, I honestly don't know if there's any place where people say, I have sinned in this way, please forgive me. You don't see Jesus here in confession or anything, right? And in the Gospel of Mark, it's very rare that you hear Jesus, or you read, read about Jesus saying to someone, I forgive you, or I absolve you of your sins in the name of him. He doesn't do that, right? So for Jesus, repentance I think, and Mark captured this beautifully throughout his whole gospel, in fact, I think for Jesus, repentance is so much bigger than listing our sins and, and getting pardoned for, the, for our sins, you know, getting kind of cleaning, clearing the slate. Again, it's important, but there's so much more going on that Jesus want, wants to give us and wants to help us work through, all right? And I, you see it in the Word. 
repent. Okay? That word in Greek is metanoia, which, if you take it apart, metanoia is meta and noia. Easy enough, right? But meta, if you look at the word meta, in Greek, the original meaning is above, beyond, changing, new, anew, okay? It's something above. Aristotle wrote his metaphysics, right? Metaphysics, for Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas later, metaphysics beyond the physical world, the unseen, above and beyond, right? So that's meta, beyond, change or difference. Noia is, it comes from the Greek word nous, N-O-U-S, which means mind or heart or soul, okay? So if meta is new and meta is above and beyond and, and noia is mind or heart or soul, change your mind, change your heart, take on a new mind, take on a new soul, go above and beyond the old mind, go above and beyond the old ways of thinking. That's what Jesus is asking of us. He wants to give us a new way of thinking, and he wants us to change the assumptions, the presuppositions that we often have. Okay, That's what he does, and this entire Gospel of Mark is all about people confronting this call and quite often failing at it, but sometimes succeeding at it, changing their minds. And you see Jesus' reaction to them, showing them what the new mind should be thinking, okay? what a new way of thinking should be. And it's quite exciting what he, he shows you the new mind should be thinking, because it's, it's far more encouraging and far more uplifting than we expect. So repentance means change your mind. Okay? And I want to look at just one. You, you read those couple chapters from the book. I want to look at just one story that we covered in, in those chapters to kind of illustrate it. And just, you saw part of it in the book, but I've got a couple other things that I wanted to hit on um, that aren't in the book. It's the story of the paralyzed man whose friends lowered him down through the roof. You know, everyone's familiar with it, right? Jesus, there's a crowd. They can't get their friend through the front door because there's too many people in the house. So they rip up this roof, which is made out of sod, thatch, you know, the old-timey roofs, and they lower their friend down. And Mark says, when Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the friends who lowered him down, he said, child, your sins are forgiven. Okay? No one repented. No one even brought up anyone's sins. You know? It's not like the paralyzed man was a horrible sinner more than anyone else and he needed to repent of his sins. Jesus saw their faith and he said, your sins are forgiven. Jesus saw that these men, and obviously the paralyzed man as well, because he was cooperating in this whole thing, had faith. They already believed the way Jesus wanted them to believe, that God is a God of forgiveness, of healing, of mercy, of restoration. And that belief drove them to the point of property damage, you know. I mean, sometimes. But I don't, I don't condone property damage, but it's the extreme way, the extreme length to which they went to get to Jesus because they believed so, so much, so deeply. Jesus saw that belief and he said, child, your sins are forgiven you. Now you can say, well, he saw it, therefore he forgave them. And that, that could well be. But I like to think, and it's not gospel truth, so it's not doctrine or whatever, but I like to think that Jesus also saw that they had already embraced God's forgiveness. He saw their faith. Faith is a way of thinking and of, and of, and of believing in God, a God of mercy, as I said, and forgiveness and healing and restoration. He saw that, and he's just proclaiming what is already there. Your sins are forgiven. He's assuring them. He's telling them, yeah, you guys get it. And you've already embraced my mercy. You've already embraced what I've come to do. Right? Isn't that awesome that he would say that? I know, it, you know, for myself, I get burdened by sin sometimes. I go to prayer. I go to mass. Or I go to confession and feeling burdened. And when I feel or touch God's presence, all that burden goes away. Even before I say, Lord, I'm so sorry. All that burden goes away because I'm encountering a God who loves 
a God who knows how, how much I struggle, a God who knows my sin, and yet who died for me anyway. It wasn't contingent. He didn't say, well, I'll forgive you only if you repent. I'll die only if you're going to repent. You know, that's, back, that's backwards. I'll die and rise only if you repent. It's, I love you so much. My mercy is right here. Please embrace it. I think that's what's going on there. Now, so remember that repentance is coming in touch with the mercy of God. It's believing that God has mercy. So now you see the scribes in this story, right? And they're, they're muttering and mumbling to each other, saying, who is this who thinks he can forgive sin? It's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Well, obviously, only God can forgive sins. But Jesus, but Mark says, Jesus knew what they were thinking. And he said, why do you think this in your hearts? Right? He's confronting the fact that they haven't repented. Their thinking, their way of thinking, they, they haven't changed their mind. It's still thinking of a very transactional type of God. That I have to do X, Y, and Z, repent this way and the other, and, and God will forgive. Right? Or their, their thinking is so low, so, so small, that there's no room for the beautifully huge mercy that God has for us. And so he confronts them. And he says, why are you thinking such? And, and the Greek is, why are you thinking such in your hearts, in your mind, in your, right? Why, why do you have these approaches, attitudes in your souls? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven, which I've already said, which, you know, has already happened, or to say, rise, take up your mat, and go home. But to show you that the Son of Man came to bring mercy and came primarily and most importantly to release people from the guilt and shame and, and, and condemnation of sin, I'll do the easier thing. You, stand up, get out of here. <laughs> it's just like, just like that. And that's what Jesus wants to say. He says, which is easier? Well, it's easier to heal someone. It's easier for me to heal someone because forgiveness is there if you take it. Healing, I do like that. Forgiveness, I've done, but you have to accept it. And you Pharisees, you scribes rather, haven't accepted it. I wish you would, but you haven't. It's harder. I could heal you in an instant from your doubt, if you have doubt or boiter or whatever your sickness is, oh, scribe over there. That wouldn't be a problem, but it's harder to embrace mercy because it's humble. It's a position of humility and trust and surrender. And you haven't got there yet. May we all get to that point and make it easier for God to forgive us because we're embracing the mercy he already has for us. So repent and believe the good news of God's mercy. Okay? This week coming up, as you pray, as you walk through some of this stuff, I want you to ask, where do I need to repent? And not what sins have... Uh, oh, of course, do an examination of conscience. Go to confession if it's available in your parish. What sins do I need to get clear of? But even more deeply, what attitudes toward God, maybe toward my husband or my wife or my kids or my cohort, what attitude do I have that God wants to heal me of, that I can turn away from, so that I can embrace and receive the mercy that Jesus has for me. Where, where do I need to repent? So that's all I've got this week. I hope you guys have a great week, and I'll see you next week. God bless you. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us again this week. Uh, I hope it was a good Bible study. I hope you're going to have, uh, well, I pray and I trust you're going to have a really good week coming up. For next week, I want you to read two more chapters in the book, Encountering the Lord in the Gospel of Mark. Okay, We're going to jump ahead. This time I want you to read chapters 12 and 13. And the titles are The Messiah Revealed, Part 1, and The Messiah Revealed, Part 2. Okay, around 80, pages 83 to 96. Okay, read them. They're the central part, they, they cover the central part the most important, pivotal part of the Gospel of Mark. And we'll be able to pull together what we've talked about so far and move forward toward the cross. So 
Have a great week. I'll talk to you later.